Hello there, dear viewer, and welcome to Hack Attack. My name is Joko Pak. I'm your host, and you're watching a Hack Attack episode. And in this episode, I want to talk a little bit about some of the content I make on this channel uh, and uh, basically what goes into it. And I'm hoping to inspire other people to make videos, um, in-depth videos. So how am I hoping to inspire you? That's the problem, because when I think about the process I have to go through to make a tutorial, how long it takes, it doesn't feel like it's inspiring, you know, because it just looks like a lot of work and it is. And a lot of work isn't inspiring in itself. So what am I doing here? I normally do tutorials and reviews on this channel and they take a long time to make. And when I make something called Docutorial, which is a documentary and a tutorial mixed into one, they take even longer. Take the latest video I made, for instance, the Heinbach uh, docutorial. November 6, 2020, I did an interview with Heinbach. And so the work on that video actually started a week before that, because I always do research about the topic, the app or hardware I'm going to review or, you know, feature in a docutorial and also the people uh, involved in its making. Whenever I do a docutorial, I'm trying to tell a story. A story about an app or a piece of hardware and also the story of its creators basically which in this case was Heinbach and Sonic Lab. So a lot of research, a lot of research and I can't even begin to emphasize how much research I do. I do research throughout an entire project when I'm doing a docutorial. Research at the beginning, research during the making and research when it's done to make sure that I got stuff right. Because when you put that much time into video, you want to make sure that you get it right. And even though I am so thorough and even though I don't trust myself, I still make mistakes. And there is a mistake in that video with Heinbach, actually. It's a spelling mistake. It's supposed to say playing. And most people will probably read that right, but it's still annoying to me. All right, so let's break down the docutorial video I made. Whenever I do a video and it's a bigger video, uh, if it's gonna go over 10 minutes into 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or in the case of the Heinbach video on, it's 30 minutes. I can't make that into one project from beginning to end because iOS is limited on RAM and processing power. And the more high-res photos you put into a text layer, the more edits you do, uh, the more text pop-ins you do, the bigger it gets the project, it's gonna get slower and slower over time and you're gonna get lag. You're always working with limited resources. And so when that happens, it also means that your editing takes slower. And so the video is gonna take longer for you to make. And to circumvent that, I make the parts I need one by one. So I make the interview video first because that colors the entire video. You know, the story I wanna tell, it's always colored by the person that I'm interviewing. I make that first and then I move on to making the tutorial and that's a video of its own. And then I produce the sound demo video and then I produce the music demo video. And in the case of the Heinbach video one, I also had to produce a video with me presenting the questions. Five elements I needed for making that video. All right, so this is clearly a how to make videos type of video. But the truth is that when I do docutorials or any type of tutorials or anything really, audio usually comes first. That's the first step before I even start any type of video work. When I do an interview with someone, it takes about between two to three hours, you know, actually sitting down, talking to someone, asking questions. And while I'm doing that, I've learned to take notes. Actually, I learned it from my partner. She is a real journalist and she's been teaching me about her job, how to not misrepresent something that someone is telling you, how to do edits, uh, how to subtitle th stuff, you know, things like that. She's been teaching me a lot about work and how to ask questions and how to take notes. Because if the interview is two and a half hours long, you listen through it four times for taking notes, 10 hours has passed and that's an entire day. I do not like wasting time. So take notes when you're interviewing someone. So I had notes for the Heinbach interview. And so it only took me still a month 
to produce the Heinbach interview bits video. Uh, the first edit I did was actually, I ended up with 45 minutes of good stuff that Heinbach was talking about. And then in the second um, iteration of that one, um, I think I ended up with 30 minutes. And then I realized I had to do a big cut in there. And I needed a clear vision for the story and the video because I, I can't put out a, a two hour video edited. It's going to take me half a year or more to make. And not many people would watch it because it's too long. So I edited it down three or four more times until I got to 16 minutes. 16 minutes from two and a half hours. If you look at this screenshot here, what you're seeing is basically Heinbach in a picture. So I always ask for a high-res picture that I can use, even if I only intend to use a small, you know, size of it. I ask for that from the interviewee because it can be hard to Google pictures like that. That's something you need to think about when making videos like this, is that when doing research, uh, you should also at the same time be looking for pictures and and things that you might need to clear with someone. In the case of my Hanbach video, I had to clear a video uh, with a guy from Music Hackspace and his channel because I wanted to use material from that in my video. Well, always think about that while you're doing research because if you do that after the fact, then that's another week or month that you need to do that work. So I got the picture. I then need to know what to title it. So I asked him, what do you want me to call you? He said, uh, composer. I put composer in there and his name, and then you see this thing jumping around. And that's the audiovisual thing I do in Visible. And the way that that's produced is basically me running this 16 minute edited audio from Heinbach into Visible with a specific template that I've made where I intend to key out the background color so that I only get the VU meter left. Red or blue or green color, and then I'll green screen, red screen, blue screen that out, until I only have that view meter left. And then I resize it and put it into that corner. And then I export that video, you know, as its own thing so that I can then use that as a layer in the actual interview video that I have to produce. And the actual interview video is where I then put in the pop-in text, you know, highlight words that Heinbach is saying. And I also put in pictures and video material that I found on his channel. It's a lot of edits. Now, when all of that is done, I end up with this 16 minute video. And that's the first part of the final video. And it took me about a month to make. Okay, so here's another tip and it has to do with dynamic subtitling. So what is dynamic subtitling? Well, if you do normal subtitling, you're printing out everything a person says exactly as they say it and you just write it out in plain text in a certain font, which is easy to read for the viewer. However, with dynamic subtitling, you can go wild, you can get creative with it. In the case of the Heinbach video, I made sure to just put in words to highlight certain things he says to get the point he's trying to make come through properly. And with dynamic subtitling, it means that it doesn't have to be the same font, it doesn't have to be the same color, it doesn't have to be the same height or width or anything. You can play around with that. As long as you make whatever the interview is saying clear or whatever you're saying clear. And one thing to think about is timing. You see, if I say the word see saw, let's take that again, see saw. You see, I don't input the word when I'm starting the word with the S. No, the word pops in at the E and A vocals because they're more pronounced. You can even see that in the audio. You get a giant jump in volume when those words appear. So it feels more dynamic, more powerful. Now, after that, I move on to the uh, presentation. And the presentation is basically me presenting the topic or the questions that I put forth to Heinbach. I did those by recording myself with a face cam and uh, just putting myself up in a corner like this. And then I just run graphics behind it. And I'll, I'll tell you one thing about that graphic I'm using here. It's a recolored thing. Uh, it's basically me taking some really uh, poorly taken bokeh footage with my iPhone 6. And then I just process that with some filters inside LumaFusion, and then I use uh, filters to color it. That's what I'm always running in the background of uh, all my videos. I like producing my own 
B-roll and, 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 and B-footage, you know? So the presentation video took me about a day to make. And a day for me is usually between eight up to 16 hours. So after making the uh, interview parts and after making the uh, presentation parts, I went on to making the tutorial parts. And this is basically me screen recording, me using the app and talking about the app at the same time. And that whole thing took me about two days to produce. And I think about 10 or 12 hour days actually of recording it and then editing it. And what takes the longest to do is the editing because I use these elements in my video where I highlight stuff with arrows and boxes and circles because I want to make my videos really, really clear. That's why I zoom in so much. That's why I say up here in the upper right corner. By the way, all of my tutorials that I've made so far on the channel can be found up here in the card popping out in the upper right corner. So even if you are doing the dishes, just listening to the video, you will know where to find it. Well, you won't be touching your screen and pressing on any playlist when you're doing your dishes, but you know what I mean. I like being really clear about stuff. I don't want the viewer to feel confused by anything going on in the video. Okay, so here's a little tip for you. Whenever I do one of these videos that I end up exporting because I intend to use this in another video or in the final edit, I always make sure to clearly mark where all the sections are because I do not want to waste time searching through footage trying to find what I'm looking for when I'm doing these edits anyway. So I insert these colored spacers and these colors, they signal to me whether it's music or face cam bits or anything else, interview bits, and then I also clearly title them. So I always know where a section begins or where it ends when I'm trying to do the final edit, looking for all the materials I've already pre-made. So the tutorial part takes two days, and then I move on to music and sounds. And that sounds as if it could be the same thing, right? Well, it's not. I also want to show you the music you can make with it. That's what music is. I make tracks with the app or the hardware that is being featured inside a video. And I just want to show you that, yes, it works. It can be done. I've done it. Now, sound demos is a different thing because sound demos are things I need to highlight stuff I do in the tutorial, for instance. So if I say, when I do this, it sounds like this, or when you do this, it sounds like this, or if you want it to sound like this, you do this and then I play a sound demo. That's what a sound demo is. Now, in the fundamental video, I didn't need that many sound demos. If we take an app like, for instance, a Sampler or Borderlands Granular, there were a, a lot more sound demos in those. By the way, those are also in that playlist, uh, yeah. Now, the sound demos doesn't take long at all. It takes about a day or so to make because it's really straightforward, you know? I just have to show what I'm explaining, but the music, that's different. That can take a huge amount of time to make. It's all depending on my creativity. So if I've got writer's block as a musician, musician's block, I don't know what to call it, but if I've got that, then it's gonna take me ages to produce music. So that can take between a week and a month or more. And in the case of the Heinbach video, it took me about uh, two weeks to make music you're gonna ask yourself, okay, so if the uh, interview took a, uh, a month, this took a few days, and that took a, a, two, a few weeks, why did it take you three months, over three months, to actually make the Heinbach video? Well, research and research and research. When doing the interview with Heinbach, there were a lot of names mentioned, there were a lot of terms mentioned, technical terms, and I had to research all of that. I also had to do more research on Heinbach himself and Sinon, uh, the guy who runs Sonic Lab, and that takes time. Finding images that I can use, finding videos that I can use, finding information about the terms, about the people being mentioned, finding images of them, finding videos of them. All of these things took up the rest of the time. But also you have to consider this. I have a YouTube channel and YouTube algorithm does not like it if you do not put out videos at least on a weekly basis. And so I have to keep putting out videos during all this time. So three months, you know, went by before I was able to finish the video. 
Now, earlier I mentioned me exporting videos for final use in a final edit and how I separate sections with colored spacers. Well, I use colors all the time. And when you're working inside LumaFusion, you can actually color clips and entire sections. And I do this all the time to keep track of where I am and where I need to go. Time that I end up saving is time that I can put into actually doing edits and making the content better. Now, once I've got the music and sound demos ready, the presentation videos ready, the tutorial bits ready, and the interview bits ready, I end up with multiple videos, finished videos, right? At this point, I still have not processed all of the audio. I always do that in the end. In the case of Heinbach, he recorded it with his microphone and, and already processed it. And when I checked it out, it already sounded good. I didn't need to do anything with the Heinbach audio, but for my own audio, I have to process all of it inside Cubasis. And that's what I do. I never process audio inside LumaFusion. I'm a music producer. I produce music with uh, Cubasis. And so I use Cubasis for all my audio editing, all my audio processing. And I have got these templates with uh, FX chains, with compressors. And when it comes to sound demos, I don't do much on them. I just put a slight compression on it or limiter and then I just try to get some loudness out of it, that's it. Because I don't want to misrepresent the sound of an app. But when I produce music, there's a production process in that. And so I, you'll often find me do multi-track recording inside AUM, which I did with Fundamental, and then I process that audio in Cubasis. I process my narration in Cubasis. And when I'm done with that, I then have all of the audio bits, for all of the video bits. And this is the point where I actually take all of this and try to put it together in the final video. That takes time too. All right, so here's another tip for you on how to save time. Whenever you bring in a text layer and you do a lot of work in it, remember to save presets and save a lot of them. I can't tell you how many times I've wasted half a day on doing something again and again and, and again because I just simply forgot to save it as a preset. And this goes for anything. If you are constantly moving a video or resizing a video the same way in all of your vids, just make a preset out of it. I mean, there's so much you can make presets for inside LumaFusion. Just save those presets. And this goes for filters too. And in the case of this Heinbach video, I did 16 hour days just editing and, and trying to put this together. Otherwise, it would have taken me another two or three weeks to finish that video. And I just really needed to get it out because I, I needed to get to work on other things. And you would think that since I've already done so much editing, so much research, I wouldn't have to do much. I would just have to cut, put in, cut, put in, yes and no. Because during a project like that, once you put everything together, even though you have this mind map or this thing that you can follow, which I produce uh, at the same time that I'm making all of these parts, I write this script for the video of the parts I have and how I'm gonna present them in the video. I also time them with a timer, you know, uh, I use a, a timing clock to see how long things take and how much music I need in there, how I need to paste, paste things, where I can eventually put ads or something like that. It doesn't come together and you can't really see the full picture until you put all of the materials together in this one video. And once you've done that, you're gonna realize at some point that maybe things aren't smooth as you want it to. And so you have to redo stuff and that takes time too. When everything is finally done, I check through the finished, processed, exported video. And I ended up with a 30 minute video and I checked it about four times. And so that's gonna take me two hours because it's half an hour long. I note down any mistakes or flowing issues I have and flowing issues, well, you, I think you get what I mean. And then I go back in and I fix some things. That stage can take 10 hours, you know, before I even upload it. I wanna make new music. Do you understand why I never get to work with music? Because I do videos like this. All of my videos are being do done this thoroughly, really. Even my five minute videos are done thoroughly. Look at my hair, look at my hair. And so the scripting of the video, it's another way of me 
keeping in control. So what do these emojis mean? Well, if you look closely here, we can see five types of emojis. And so this note one here, this is sound demos. The microphone is stuff that I've recorded on mic, but you can't see me on camera. The talking emoji here, those are the interview bits with Heinbach. The camera one are for presentation parts and face cam parts. And then this thing, well, it stands for music demos. And this way I'm able to keep track of my project and I make this script while I'm making all the parts. And so when all the parts are done, when the audio is fixed, I just follow this and put it all together. And like I said, it doesn't always, you know, come together nicely. Sometimes I find flowing issues, but I can always fix them then. And I have to do less work because I've already done so much work before. All I'm trying to say is, and I'll quote Jim Sterling, it's always good to have a map. Thank you so much for watching. All comments and ratings are very much appreciated. If you like this video, if you want to see more like this, which I, I don't even believe you do, but if you do, had me a thumbs up. If you hated this video, give me a thumbs down. Either way, you know, interactions are good on YouTube. Um, if you want to support me in a financial way, you have these links over here. You can find, uh, yeah, as usual, I wish you a very productive week. Now go finger all of your stuff and have a lot of fun doing it. And all the links to all the things can be found down in the description. I recommend LumaFusion a lot to anyone wanting to do video editing on, uh, on, on, on iOS. <sighs> I'm still looking forward to at some point going to like a dinner party and then there's a mathematician and then I can chat to him uh, or her about uh, stochastics and then I'll tell them, yeah, I really like the feeling of Bernoulli and I hope they will go, yeah, I do too. <laughs>